Gilgamesh, Tablet 11 Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim, the distant one, As I look upon you, Utnapishtim, your limbs are not different, you are just as I am. Indeed, you are not different at all, you are just as I am. Yet your heart is drained of battle spirit, you lie flat on your back, your arm idle. You then, how did you join the ranks of the gods and find eternal life? Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, I will reveal to you, O Gilgamesh, a secret matter, and a mystery of the gods I will tell you. The city Shurupak, a city you yourself have knowledge of, which once was set on the bank of the Euphrates, that aforesaid city was ancient, and gods once were within it. The great gods resolved to send the deluge. Their father, Anu, was sworn. The counselor, the valiant Enlil, their throne-bearer, Ninurta, their canal officer, Inugi, their leader, Ea, was sworn with them. He repeated their plans to the reed fence. Reed fence, reed fence, wall, wall. Listen, O reed fence, pay attention, O wall. O man of Shurupak, son of Ubartutu, wreck house, build boat, forsake possessions and seek life. Belongings reject and save life. Take aboard the boat, seed of all living things. The boat you shall build, let her dimensions be measured out. Let her width and length be equal. Roof her over like the watery depths. I understood full well. I said to Ea, my lord, Your command, my lord, exactly as you said it, I shall faithfully execute. What shall I answer the city, the populace, and the elders? Ea made ready to speak, saying to me, his servant, So you shall speak to them thus. No doubt Enlil dislikes me. I shall not dwell in your city. I shall not set my foot on the dry land of Enlil. I shall descend to the watery depths and dwell with my lord, Ea. Upon you he shall shower down in abundance, a windfall of birds, a surprise of fishes. He shall pour upon you a harvest of riches, in the morning cakes and spates, in the evening grains and rains. At the first glimmer of dawn, the land was assembling at the gates of Atrahasis. The carpenter carried his axe, the reed-cutter carried his stone, the old men brought cordage, the young men ran around. The wealthy carried the pitch, the poor brought what was in need of. In five days I had planked her hull, one full acre was her deck space, ten dozen cubits the height of each of her sides, ten dozen cubits square her outer dimensions. I lay out her structure, I planned her design, I decked her in six, I divided her in seven, her interior I divided in nine. I drove the water plugs into her, I saw to the spars and laid in what was needful, thrice thirty-six hundred measures of pitch I poured in the oven. Thrice thirty-six hundred measures of tar I poured out inside her. Thrice thirty-six hundred measures basket-bearers brought aboard for oil, not counting the thirty-six hundred measures of oil that the offering consumed, and twice thirty-six hundred measures of oil that the boat-builders made off with. For the builders I slaughtered bullocks. I killed sheep upon sheep every day, beer, ale, oil, and wine I gave out to the workers like river water. They made a feast as on New Year's Day. I dispensed ointment with my own hands. By the setting of Shamash the ship was completed. Since boarding was very difficult, they brought up gangplanks, fore and aft. They came up her sides, two-thirds of her height. Whatever I had, I loaded upon her. What silver I had, I loaded upon her. What gold I had, I loaded upon her. What living creatures I had, I loaded upon her. I set up on board all my family and kin, beasts of the steppe, wild animals of the steppe, all types of skilled craftsmen I set up on board. Shamash set for me the appointed time. In the morning, cakes and spates, in the evening, grains and rains. Go into your boat and cock the door. That appointed time arrived, in the morning, cakes and spates, in the evening, grains and rains, I gazed upon the face of the storm, the weather was dreadful to behold. I went into the boat and cocked the door, to the cocker of the boat, to Pazur Amuri, the boatman I gave over the edifice with all it contained. At the first glimmer of dawn a black cloud arose above the horizon, inside it Adad was thundering. While the destroying gods Shulat and Hanish went in front, moving as an advance force over hill and plain. 
Arakal tore out the mooring posts of the world. Ninurta came and made the dikes overflow. The supreme gods held torches aloft, setting the land ablaze with their glow. Adad's awesome power passed over the heavens. Whatever was light was turned into darkness. He flooded the land. He smashed it like a clay pot. For one day the storm wind blew, swiftly it blew, the flood came forth. It passed over the people like a battle, no one could see the one next to him, the people could not recognize one another in the downpour. The gods became frightened of the deluge, they shrank back, went up to Anu's highest heaven, the gods cowered like dogs, crouching outside. Ishtar screamed like a woman in childbirth, and sweet-voiced Belit Ili wailed aloud. Would that day had come to naught when I spoke up for the evil in the assembly of the gods? How could I have spoken up for evil in the assembly of the gods and spoken up for battle to destroy my people? It was I myself who brought my people into the world. Now, like a school of fish, they choke up the sea. The supreme gods were weeping with her. The gods sat where they were, weeping. Their lips were parched, taking on a crust. Six days and seven nights the wind continued, the deluge, the windstorm leveled the land. When the seventh day arrived, the windstorm and deluge left off their battle, which had struggled like a woman in labor. The sea grew calm, the tempest stilled, the deluge ceased. I looked at the weather. Stillness reigned, and the whole human race had turned into clay. The landscape was flat as a rooftop. I opened the hatch, sunlight fell on my face. Falling to my knees, I sat down weeping, tears running down my face. I looked at the edges of the world, the borders of the sea. At twelve times sixty double leagues the periphery emerged. The boat had come to rest on Mount Nimush. Mount Nimush held the boat fast, not letting it move. One day, a second day, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, not letting it move. A third day, a fourth day, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, not letting it move. A fifth day, a sixth day, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, not letting it move. When the seventh day arrived, I brought out a dove and set it free. The dove went off and returned. No landing place came to its view, so it turned back. I brought out a swallow and set it free. The swallow went off and returned. No landing place came to its view, so it turned back. I brought out a raven and set it free. The raven went off and saw the ebbing of the waters. It ate, preened, left droppings, did not turn back. I released all to the four directions. I brought out an offering and offered it to the four directions. I set up an incense offering on the summit of the mountain. I arranged seven and seven cult vessels. I heaped reeds, cedar, and myrtle in their bowls. The gods smelled the savor. The gods smelled the sweet savor. The gods crowded round the sacrificer like flies. As soon as Belet Ely arrived, she held up the great fly ornaments that Anu had made in his ardor. O oh gods, these shall be my lapis necklace, lest I forget. I shall be mindful of these days and not forget, not ever. The god should come to the incense offering, but Enlil should not come to the incense offering, for he irrationally brought on the flood, and marked my people for destruction. As soon as Enlil arrived, he saw the boat, Enlil flew into a rage. He was filled with fury at the gods. Who came through alive? No man was to survive destruction. Ninurta made ready to speak, said to the valiant Enlil, who but Ea could contrive such a thing, for Ea alone knows every artifice? Ea made ready to speak, said to the valiant Enlil, You, O valiant one, are the wisest of the gods. How could you irrationally have brought on the flood? Punish the wrongdoer for his wrongdoing. Punish the transgressor for his transgression. But be lenient, lest he be cut off. Bear with him, lest he be... Instead of your bringing on a flood, let the lion rise up and diminish the human race. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let the wolf rise up and diminish the human race. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let famine rise up and wreak havoc in the land. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let pestilence rise up and wreak havoc in the land. It was not I who disclosed the secret of the great gods. I made Atrahasis have a dream, and so he heard the secret of the gods. Now, then, make some plan for him.
Then Enlil came up into the boat. Leading me by the hand, he brought me up too. He brought my wife up and had her kneel beside me. He touched our brows, stood between us to bless us. Hitherto Utnapishtim has been a human being. Now Utnapishtim and his wife shall become like us gods. Utnapishtim shall dwell far distant at the source of the rivers. Thus it was that they took me far distant and had me dwell at the source of the rivers. Now then, who will convene the gods for your sake, that you may find the eternal life you seek? Come, come, try not to sleep for six days and seven nights. As he sat there on his haunches, sleep was swirling over him like a mist. Utnapishtim said to her, to his wife, Behold this fellow who seeks eternal life, sleep swirls over him like a mist. His wife said to him, to Utnapishtim the distant one, Do not touch him that the man may wake up, that he may return safe on the way whence he came, that through the gate he came forth he may return to his land. Utnapishtim said to her, to his wife, since the human race is duplicitous, he'll endeavor to dupe you. Come, come, bake his daily loaves, put them one after another by his head, then mark the wall for each day he has slept. She baked his daily loaves for him, put them one after another by his head, then dated the wall for each day he slept. The first loaf was dried hard, the second was leathery, the third soggy, the crust of the fourth turned white, the fifth was grey with mould, the sixth was fresh, the seventh was still on the coals when he touched him. The man woke up. Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim the distant one, Scarcely had sleep stolen over me when straight away you touched me and roused me. Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, Up with you, Gilgamesh, count your daily loaves, that the days you have slept may be known to you. The first loaf is dried hard, the second is leathery, the third soggy, the crust of the fourth is turned white, the fifth is grey with mould, the sixth is fresh, the seventh was still in the coals when I touched you and woke you up. Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim, the distant one, What then should I do, Utnapishtim? Whither should I go? Now that the bereaver has seized my flesh, death lurks in my bedchamber, and wherever I turn, there is death. Utnapishtim said to him, to Urshanabi the boatman, Urshanabi, may the harbour offer you no haven, may the crossing point reject you, be banished from the shore you shuttled to, the man you brought here, his body is matted with filthy hair, hides have marred the beauty of his flesh, take him away, Urshanabi, bring him to the washing place, have him wash out his filthy hair with water, clean as snow, have him throw away his hides, let the sea carry him off, let his body be rinsed clean, let his headband be new, have him put on raiment worthy of him, until he reaches the city, until he completes his journey, let his garments stay spotless, fresh, and new. Urshanabi took him away and brought him to the washing place. He washed out his filthy hair with water, clean as snow. He threw away his hides, the sea carried him off. His body was rinsed clean. He renewed his headband. He put on raiment worthy of him, until he reached his city, until he completed his journey. His garments would stay spotless, fresh, and new. Gilgamesh and Urshanabi embarked on the boat. They launched the boat, they embarked upon it. His wife said to him, to Utnapishtim, the distant one, Gilgamesh has come here, spent with exertion. What will you give him for his homeward journey? At that he, Gilgamesh, lifted the pole, bringing the boat back by the shore. Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, you have come here, spent with exertion. What shall I give you for your homeward journey? I will reveal to you, O Gilgamesh, a secret matter, and a mystery of the gods I will tell you. There is a certain plant. Its stem is like a thorn bush. Its thorns, like the wild rose, will prick your hand. If you can secure this plant... There's a bit of a gap. No sooner had Gilgamesh heard this, he opened a shaft, flung away his tools, he tied heavy stones to his feet, they pulled him down into the watery depths. He took the plant, though it pricked his hand. He cut the heavy stones from his feet, the sea cast him up on his home shore. Gilgamesh said to him, to Urshanabi the boatman, Urshanabi, this plant is a cure for heartache, whereby a man will regain his stamina, I will take it to ramparted Uruk. I will have an old man eat some and so test the plant. 
His name shall be Old Man Has Become Young Again Man. I myself will eat it, and so return to my carefree youth. At twenty double leagues they took a bite to eat. At thirty double leagues they made their camp. Gilgamesh saw a pond whose water was cool. He went down into it to bathe in the water. A snake caught the scent of the plant. Stealthily it came up and carried the plant away. On its way back it shed its skin. Thereupon Gilgamesh sat down weeping. His tears flowed down his face. He said to Urshanabi, the boatman, For whom, Urshanabi, have my hands been toiling? For whom has my heart's blood been poured out? For myself I have obtained no benefit. I have done a good deed for a reptile. Now flood waters rise against me for twenty double leagues. When I opened the shaft, I flung away the tools. How shall I find my bearings? I have come too far to go back, and I abandoned the boat on the shore. At twenty double leagues they took a bite to eat. At thirty double leagues they made their camp. When they arrived and ramparted Uruk, Gilgamesh said to him, to Urshanabi the boatman, Go up, Urshanabi, pace out the walls of Uruk. Study the foundation terrace and examine the brickwork. Is not its masonry of kiln-fired brick? And did not seven masters lay its foundations? One square mile of city, one square mile of gardens, one square mile of clay pits, a half square mile of Ishtar's dwelling, three and a half square miles is the measure of Uruk.